I think that the alternative society is react is a reaction against the sheer joylessness and meaninglessness of most people's lives. That's what the alternative society is all about. Jumbo is coming through. Jumbo is standing up for you. This is politics, alternative style. The elephant was advertising for anti-pollution, but joined in the festivities to launch a new political party called Dwarf, an opportunity for a carnival, not a serious crusade. Gatherings like this are not unusual in Notting Hill Gate, for this is deep in the heart of alternative country. A few square miles around the Portobello Road are the center of a national network of groups and activities originally called the underground. Sociologist Theodore Rozak calls it the counterculture. Its new name is the alternative society. Here the most striking difference is not between black and white, rich or poor, but between long-haired alternative people who call themselves freaks or heads and the rest known as straight society. But to be a real freak is not just a matter of wearing the right uniform or shopping at the right shops on Saturday afternoon. It's more subtle than that. What sort of attitudes does an underground person have? Uh, it seems to me that there's an attitude towards sex which is, which is different. It's now become much more libertarian uh, and guiltless. I mean, young people do amazing things sexually these days, but they, uh, which it perhaps isn't much dif different from previous times, but they don't feel at all guilty about it. Um, I think their attitude to culture now is radically different. I mean, whereas before, uh, if something was ephemeral, <coughs> uh, it was considered to be trivial and worthless, whereas now that's become uh, perhaps an advantage if an art form's ephemeral, like pop music's the obvious thing uh, in that. Um, I think that they now just perhaps... You see, you know, when society does go through a fantastic change, like when the Industrial Revolution came, came along, there was a drug to go with it. The drug was gin. And I think that there's a, now a similar fantastic change in a lifestyle, and there's other drugs to go with that, of which the most popular well, the most fashionable is, is cannabis. So that seems to me to be part of the underground. Another ingredient is the, the, the high mobility of the people involved, that the people don't, no longer set about having families living in a suburban house in that one spot for the rest of their lives. They move around an amazing amount. I mean, you get literally, you know, thousands and thousands of people hitchhiking from, from Istanbul to, to Kathmandu or to Bangkok. Uh, for year, you know, year after year, it's not just a sort of quick two months holiday abroad and then back to back to their job. And it seems to me that so the travel or or being a nomad is part of part of the underground situation. Um, and also, that lastly, I mean, a, a political attitude. I and you know, and had a, a, a really strong uh, political attitude of anti-authoritarianism, of anti-society. Uh, all these are part of of the alternative culture. People have many of these attitudes at a small bazaar called Friends in the Portobello Road. It's part of a general commercial trend toward Eastern-style shops, but there are no big fashion interests behind Friends. It's run by heads, for heads. They hardly ever open before 11.30 a.m., the beginning of the alternative day, and they sell homemade and second-hand goods which appeal to people like themselves. But the commercial drive isn't very noticeable at Friends. People are very happy to just sit around talking to one another, a favorite pastime. Business is slack unless the tourists pour in. All the regulars can afford to do is gaze at the clothes and listen to the music. Like most underground people, they don't like being filmed. 
They feel their experiments are private, and they fear the media will either publicize them inaccurately or bring them within the orbit of straight society. With its cozy, companionable atmosphere, joss sticks slowly burning, Friends is part of the alternative dream, a dream of a vague, utopian communal society which they don't feel the need to define. What in particular are they reacting against in straight society? The majority of people, I would argue, in, you know, not only in this country, but in, you know, in the first world, in, in, in Europe and in America, are involved in... Um, yeah, uh, in executing a series of monotonous and pointless tasks for the sole reason that that is the only way they can see for them of, of, of how to survive. Richard Neville laid down the ground rules for the alternative life, but the deeper roots of alternative thinking lie in the ideas of men like the European philosopher Herbert Marcuse. What Richard Neville has done for the underground is promote its image. He's a journalist who started the controversial underground magazine, Oz. I think that the alternative press, both you know, in, in America, throughout the world, in this country, um, is one of the more positive aspects of the alternative society because it's, in its sheer presentation, in its sheer look, I mean, it's very, I mean, just talking professionally for a minute, um, in the terms of its topography, its use of colours, uh, design and layout, it's totally different. I'm much more, I would say, akin to a colour TV screen than it is to the old-fashioned molten lead, bits of grey eight-point type publications, you know, which were uh, really a result of a sort of, you know, 19th century way of thinking. So I think in that respect, they're sort of, you know, the, the, they're McLuhanistic and, and tactile and lateral. That's interesting. But I also think that they've done a fantastic, like, you know, the, the very initial uh, awareness to the horrors of Vietnam, I mean, was begun in the underground press. Um, they were exposing some of the things, you know, the My Lai type situations in Vietnam three or four years ago, that they were also uh, the first people to support the Black Panther movement was the underground press. In other words, they, you know, they've always been years ahead of even uh, the darling publications of the left like The Guardian and The New Statesman. I also think that, 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 that the only reliable information about drugs um, and even some of the more interesting things about technology, this can only, only be gained from the underground press. <laughs> The alternative press has a young readership, mostly under 25. Its subject matter is not very different from the orthodox press. Its viewpoint is. It's revolutionary and uninhibited, and often at risk with the law. The newspaper Friends has its offices above the Friends Market in the Portobello Road. Friends is an alternative paper differs from Fleet Street insofar as we try to work in an informal atmosphere where there's a bit of joy, where we enjoy what we're doing, where we're not held down to the drudgery of nine to five jobs, where we're not tied up in various bureaucratic processes that um, most, of our, most of Fleet Street seems to be involved in. What we're trying to do is to have a place to work which is not really work. Um, this is At the, the moment, Alan Marcus, in the editor, story. is dealing with news, and Nikki is preparing copy on a typesetter. But they don't like specialization, and often all try each other's jobs. Noon is rather early in the day for much obvious joy at Friends. They'd been up all night working on the issue. Barney is usually art editor. The alternative press displays a lot of talent and skill. But many papers are bedeviled by distribution difficulties and internal ideological battles. Uh, 
opting out does create its own kind of problems. If a head has a problem, the normal social work agencies are not always geared to or concerned with helping. Instead, the alternative has evolved its own style of welfare organization. Hello, Bip. Yeah, can you hold on, please? This is one of the 150 calls coming through to BIT every day. BIT is the underground's answer to the welfare state, an information and advisory service which operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's a kind of nerve center. Pinned all over the walls are names of contacts, for BIT's chief function is referring people on to alternative places or sympathetic official organizations. BIT's main strength is that the young and unattached do trust them. It's run by people like themselves. Any time, any day, they drop in just to hang around or have a cup of tea in the cafe downstairs or to look at the notice boards for information they can't get elsewhere. Ian King is BIT's unofficial social worker. He lives below the office, in the dilapidated house they rent from Westminster Council. He deals with the more complex legal problems, although he deny having any more say than anyone else. He also does all the typing for their magazine, Bitman, which circulates news and information to similar organizations in other parts of Britain. Bit is a group of individuals. Uh, we don't have any bureaucracy, we don't have any files. So the only thing that Bit can really do that other people sometimes have difficulty in doing and that is seeing people without prejudging them because we just kind of get to know somebody over a, over a long period of time many professional social workers uh, have been indoctrinated at, at, at college to uh, view human behavior patterns as a science we refute the idea that you can judge people uh, from, from textbooks you can, we feel you can only understand people through experience, through getting to know them on an individual basis. Um, yes, can you hold on? BIT pays three shift workers five pounds a week out of their grant from an international charity and has a core of volunteers. The BIT workers are not professionally qualified, but have themselves experienced the kind of problems which come to them from a wide range of callers. We deal with individuals. Uh, we don't deal with groups. Uh, the person might be black, he might be white, he might be yellow. Uh, it could be somebody who's just come out of Borstal. It could be somebody who just wants to know directions from um, Liverpool Street Station to Cannes Street Station. You can't, you can't categorize the people who come to BIT. BIT is a very unpredictable place. At times vague, at other times helpful. I came here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, looking for a bit of advice. It was about a sickness benefit claim I was making. I was having a bit of difficulty, but uh, you advised me when I came. It was a valid claim. And I went back, but they refused to pay me unless I was threatened with eviction. So I just wondered, you know, is there anything I can do now? Well, I think your best bet is the claimants' union. What office did you go to? Uh, the Twickenham branch. Uh, well, I can give you the address of the South London claimants' union. Bit doesn't like relying on straight society. They don't want to submit reports and spruce up their image. To them, organization spells inflexibility. They want to retain a more personal contact. These are old Christian Judaic values, you know, mutual respect, love, compassion, uh, that we see being eroded and destroyed by materialism, whether it's in Russia or whether it's in America um, or in Britain. Well, this this right. materialism that's based on to almost total n lack of respect for another person's in individuality or uniqueness as a human being. Every evening from five onwards, the office begins to fill up as people roll in with nowhere to live. They've come to bid for a crash pad, somewhere to stay for a night or two, free of charge. Bit keeps a list of people who are prepared to help out. Anyone who rings up wanting a crash pad has to come in in person before an address is handed over. This is to try and prevent hospitality from being abused. On the whole, it works, and there's a surprising amount of mutual respect this night was relatively quiet. Usually there are not enough crash pads to go around. Why have people come to bid for help? I'm not living at home because I left to try and be independent.